your thinking patterns don't begin with a thought. What do they begin with? It's triggered by a feeling or an emotion. Ah. So your body reacts to something first. So you feel the stress first or you feel the trigger related to past trauma first. You feel something happening in your body first. And the mistake that we make is we then immediately race up to our heads and we assess with our minds, what does that mean? Oh, something must be wrong. Oh, I'm really stressed out. Oh, this isn't working. And then your thoughts, usually negative when it comes to some stress response, then dictate what you do next, which is yell or be frustrated or feel frazzled. And so what I'm going to tell you to do is to reverse that chain of events. Because everything begins with a sensation in the body. Your nervous system picks up on the cues around you first. Then it goes up into your mind. And your mind tries to make sense of the sensation. And that making sense of, which is usually a negative interpretation, that then triggers a negative response. Uh. And so let me give you an example just for those of you that don't have a steam shower or don't have time to jump in a cold plunge. Have you ever noticed- I just had a cold bath. I, cold just, bath. Fill it, I just fill it up with cold water <laughs> well, or I take a cold shower. <laughs> so yes, and either work. But have you ever noticed that you can be super frustrated or feeling really low energy or kind of depressed or anxious? And if you go outside for a walk alone, that within 10 minutes you feel different. Yeah, totally. It's because you have shifted your physiological state. And when you shift or relax your physiological state, it relaxes your mind. Yeah. And so I think a lot of us, and talk therapy, talk therapy is a fabulous thing if you can afford to do it. But what happens in talk therapy is you talk through all this stuff and you're in a calm state when you're in therapy, aren't you? Mm. So you're utilizing a part of your brain to talk through the issues in your life when you are in a calm, non-reactive state. And then have you ever noticed you can talk for an hour with your therapist, but then you get out into your life and you get into the situation with your spouse or your kids that, or your colleague that you just processed with your therapist. You know that it is related to your trauma from childhood. You know that you're working on not being a yeller. Mm. You know you're working on all these patterns. And yet you get into the situation. And you're triggered. And you're triggered. Well, the reason, and then all of a sudden you lose control again. And the reason why that happens is because it's not about your thinking first. It's about the fact that all of the triggers are stored in your nervous system and in your body. And you in therapy are using a part of the brain, mm. your prefrontal cortex, which is present when you're calm. But when you get triggered in life, your kids are, frus are frustrating you. The traffic is terrible. You know, you're exhausted and you didn't record the fourth <laughs> podcast in the day. Yeah you're now in a different part of the brain yeah. and your nervous system is now flipped on. And so that's why you have to attack your mindset from your physiological state and you've got to use these tools. Now, a second thing that I want to say is this. I said that you can choose to become who you want to become at any moment. Mm -hmm. I subscribe to the whole body of research around behavioral activation therapy. Okay. What's that? Behavioral activation therapy is act like the person you want to become now. So act into the feeling instead of feel into the acting. Yes. So let's just say that you are somebody who wants to be, um, I don't know, we'll just use an example. If you want to, you want to be somebody like part of your bucket list, because you've read Young Forever and you want to be, you know, a marathon runner and you're going to get back in shape, right? Instead of thinking about it, instead of like being the you today that's 20 pounds over shape and the last place that you've run is to the car to try to beat the parking uh, meter person, yeah. you know, that's the last time you ever took a run. Yeah. In order to become the new version of yourself, start to act like a marathon runner would today. What do they do? Well, they have tennis shoes. They typically go outside every day. They might have different ways of eating. They probably follow different social media accounts than you do. Mm -hmm. They probably wake up at a different time. And so if you start acting like who you want to be today, an interesting, happen an interesting thing happens with your mindset. You see, when your brain sees you doing something new, 
it starts to relate to you as that new person. If you, this is why mantras often are bullshit. Ah. Because people will want to learn how to love themselves, Dr. Hyman, and they will stand in front of a mirror. Affirmations. You mean. Yeah. After yeah. 40 years of beating them up, beating themselves up, hate my body, I hate this, I'm a loser, I'm unlovable, nobody's ever going to love you, you failed at this, you failed at that, now look at the bags under your eyes and one boob's hanging lower and this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> You've been saying that for decades. You cannot stand in front of that mirror and say the affirmation, I love myself, because your brain's like, bitch, no, you don't. Did you see how you talk to yourself? I don't believe that. And so you so have true. to take the actions first hmm. before you feel like it. Because if you see yourself following Dr. Hyman's protocol and eating in a way that actually activates the healing part of your body, your brain looks at you and goes, oh, look at you. You actually do care about your health. And your brain starts to change the things it's telling you. It begins with your actions first. And then what about the excuses that we all make? Oh, I can't because of this. Or I don't have time or I'm too tired uh -huh. or... You know, I don't have money yeah. or I don't, whatever the excuses are. Yeah. How do, how do you navigate that? Because I, I think the idea of acting into the feeling is a brilliant one. And I often tell people that just, just try it. And then you don't have to actually, you know, decide you're going to do it. You just have to try it and then see how you feel. Yeah. So here's the thing about feelings. It's interesting. I think you should ignore your feelings. What? Yeah, <laughs> I do. We should talk about our feelings, express our feelings. Uh, no, you should ignore. When it comes to change, you're going to have to ignore how you feel because mm. you are never going to feel like doing something that is different than what you always do, done. Your brain is not wired that way. Your brain is wired for certainty. Your nervous system is wired for safety. Your entire body is predisposed to keep you in the patterns that you're in because it knows them. Yeah. Even though it sucks, Dr. Hyman, for you to tell yourself forever that you're unlovable or you're unworthy or you're only you're always going to be with broken people, even though it sucks, it's familiar. Yeah. And so it doesn't make any sense that you would tell yourself things over and over and over that continue to make you feel broken, but it's familiar. Mm -hmm. Anytime you try to change a thinking pattern or you try to change a behavior pattern, your own body will shove resistance in your way because your body is biased towards wanting you to continue to eat what you eat, continue to think. Autopilot. Think. Yeah, it's just on autopilot. And so number one, expect to never feel like it. Motivation's garbage. <laughs> it's not going to be there when you need it. Yeah. Um, expect to not feel like eating what Dr. Hyman tells you to, to eat. Expect to not uh, feel like interrupting the bullshit thoughts that you don't want to take with you in the future. Mm -hmm. Expect to not feel like it. And so that leaves you with only one thing. You have to force yourself to do it. There is no other way. There's no, this is not easy. If it were, everybody would have six pack abs. Everyone would have a million dollars in the bank. Yeah. And so your excuses are always going to be it's there. True. And when you realize that there's nothing wrong with you. There's no, you don't lack the willpower or discipline. That's not the issue. The issue is you've been waiting to feel mm. like doing it. And you're yeah. never going to feel like doing it because this is what you've always done. And so expect the resistance to be there. And you can use the five second rule. That's why I invented the thing. Tell See, us about that. What's the five second rule? So you the wrote, five second rule. You wrote a book about it. I did. <laughs> I did. Um, the five second rule is a brain hack that I created in a moment of desperation because like everybody, um, I didn't feel like doing the things I needed to do to address the problems in my life. It was 2007. Mm. My husband and I were 800 grand in debt. Hey, hey, hey. His restaurant business was failing. I had lost my job. Our entire life was uh, what we put on the line to start the restaurant business. We had three kids under the age of 10. We were living in a fancy suburb outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and um, we were about to lose everything. Mm. Like I, checks were bouncing left and right. I was unemployed. Chris was had not been paid in six months. Friends and family had invested in the business, so we couldn't really tell anybody how bad it was. Oy. And at 41, Dr. Hyman, I found myself... Uh, in a situation where I didn't even recognize myself. Like I, I never thought that this would be what happened to my life. Mm. And I faced my issues and our problems um, 
by drinking myself into the ground, screaming at Chris mm. and blaming everything on him and basically sleeping in, hitting the snooze button five times. The kids were missing the bus. Like it was, mm. I, and here's the, iron, the irony is that even when you're in a crisis, you know what you should do. So there's some part of yourself that knew. Of course. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that you should get your ass out of bed and get a job. Get the kids and, breakfast. Yeah, and, and, the, the, and the, the drinking yeah. isn't helping. And maybe you should tell somebody what's going on. Maybe you should ask for help. Maybe you should get outside and take a walk. Like this isn't PhD material level crap that you need to do. Mm -mm. But I couldn't make myself do it. Why? Because I didn't feel like it. Mm. And when you start to blow off the little things, like getting up on time, eating healthy, practicing kindness to yourself, staying connected, asking for help. When you start to get the little things wrong, it just snowballs into everything being wrong. And the good news is the way that you get back on track, and this is also what you believe and what your research and your work demonstrates, is that you get your life back on track. You get your health back on track. You reset your mind and the default ways that you think the exact same way by getting the little things right. Mm. Because when you get up, when the alarm rings, your brain sees a human being that has the willpower to get up. When you make your bed in the morning, your brain sees a human being that completes things. When you walk into the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you don't criticize yourself, but you give yourself a high five in the mirror, which is something I call the Another high book. five habit. Another yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> you literally activates neural pathways in your brain around positive encouragement toward self. Mm -hmm. You know, when you journal, when you meditate, when you move your body, your brain sees a human being that prioritizes themselves. Mm. So it's through the actions, the teeny, teeny little actions that snowball into massive transformation. And so I, um, one night, it was Tuesday. It was a, no, it was a Monday night in 2008. I mean, it was bad. We were a week away from a bankruptcy proceeding. Lean's on the house. Chris and I fighting like cats and dogs. And I'm sitting in my living room and I'm like, Mel, you got to pull your shit together. Like tomorrow it's the new you woman. You got to get up. You got to be nice to Chris. You got to look for a job. You got to get, get, get out, get those kids on the bus. You got to do it all. And what happened is I all of a sudden saw a rocket ship launch across the television screen. And I thought, that's it. That's like the answer. Li literally watched yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a dumbest story. I, I was four bourbon Manhattans into the evening. So it was probably the alcohol that <laughs> made me make the connection. But I was like, that's it. Tomorrow morning when the alarm goes off, you're going to launch yourself out of bed so fast, just like NASA launches a rocket, that you're not going to be in that bed, Mel, when the anxiety and the depression start hit. Because mm. I was having cascading panic attacks, yeah. like generalized at this mm. point. Mm. So the next morning, the alarm rings. And all I did was count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And I stood up. And that one decision changed the trajectory of my life. And what I had discovered by mistake during one of the worst moments of my life is the single most powerful starting ritual, mm. which is what habit researchers and neuroscientists call a technique metacognition that you can use to interrupt old habit loops stored in the ba basal ganglia. That's 5, so 4, 3, 2, 1 interrupts that encoded pattern and it draws your focus to the prefrontal cortex, giving you a manual way to switch gears between autopilot, subconscious, trauma patterns, all of it, and activate the part of the brain that helps you change, that helps you learn new behavior, that helps you take control. The five second rule has now spread. That sounds like the holy grail. Like, oh, it is the holy grail. It's now being used in clinical settings with pediatricians. It's profoundly effective with OCD and PTSD. I had an entire uh, inpatient uh, wing, the medical staff in a Philadelphia hospital uh, come and tell us that of all the things that they can give somebody uh, on discharge after an inpatient commit, the five second rule is probably the most effective thing. Because so break it down. What is the five second rule? So the five second rule is any moment where you know what you should do, but you feel the feeling come up, hesitation, anxiety, fear, heaviness, trauma, 
whatever it may be that causes that momentary hesitation. Mm. If you don't physically move within five seconds of that moment of hesitation, the subconscious part of your brain takes over. To physically move. You got to physically move. And so there's this window, this five second window. Psychologists call this the difference between a bias toward thinking versus a bias toward action. Mm. And many of us, especially if we're analytical or we're introverted or we struggle with anxiety or ADHD or depression or a whole trauma, we have a bias towards stopping to think and consider what to do mm. versus doing what we need to do. And I'm talking about these windows of time where you're sitting in a meeting at work. You have an idea to share. Yeah. And you don't say it. Correct. And you wonder why you're getting passed over at work. You wonder why you're not getting promoted. It's because you're not visible. And it comes down to these moments. Same thing at home. There's things you want to say. There's hard conversations to have. Or what about exercise? <laughs> the hardest part is getting out the door. As my mother used to say, the minute I get the urge to exercise... I lie down until it goes away. Yes. Yes. Well, you don't even have to lie down because it goes away if you don't move within five seconds. She was an expert at that. Yeah. And so, you know, how you use it is in these moments or like addiction, it's profoundly effective with addiction because you feel yourself drawn towards something. Five, four, three, two, one, count backwards, physically move away from the thing. So you just literally just say five, four, three, two, one. And yeah. then- like yeah. get your body up and go to the other yeah. room. Yeah, and or here's here's different. the cool trick. Like you don't have to do jumping jacks no. or stand on your head no. or anything. No, here's the cool trick. Counting backwards is an action. Yeah. So it's like a Trojan horse because let's face it, putting down the alcohol is difficult. It feels hard. You don't want to. You you know like have this neurochemical draw to it. When you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, you've actually made a decision not to do it. Mm. So the counting is like the first domino that falls, and then you turn, mm. and now you're moving in a different direction. And so the five second rule became a tool that I used to push myself through the feelings and anxiety and depression and sadness and anger and grief and all the bullshit feelings that are very real Yeah. that dictate what you do. Well, you and were in a really I, tough situation and it's understandable why you felt how you felt. Yes. And you could choose one of two things, either to just go back to bed and not deal with it or wake up and deal with it. Yeah. But we make 30,000 decisions a day. And the vast majority of them we make with our subconscious. And if you want to become a different person, you have to make intentional decisions that are aligned with the kind of person that you want to become. If you want to follow all of Dr. You know, Hyman's advice, you have to make different decisions. And so counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, is a tool that you can use to activate the part of the brain that you need to consciously make different decisions. And there's even more involved here because, you know, there's uh, this uh, famous researcher, Dr. Judith Willis out at UCLA. Yeah. And she has studied the impact that the nervous system has on decision making. And what she has discovered is that when your fight or flight sympathetic nervous system is activated, so in situations where you're procrastinating, that's a fight or flight Nervous system. Because mm, pro procrastination is a freeze. Yeah. Alert. Freeze, freeze, right. Yeah. I, I, you know, fight or flight. And freeze. Freeze. Yes. Right. And anxiety or nerves or nervousness or depression, if you're in any, or just even worrying and overthinking, your sympathetic nervous system is now flipped on. Mm. Your prefrontal cortex, according to the research at, with, at UCLA, Dr. Judith Wilson, Willis, your prefrontal cortex does not function in its full capacity when your alarm state is triggered. No, it no, can't. It can't. Yeah. And so- There's yeah. often a disconnect between the limbic system, which is the reptile, lizard, mm -hmm. being stress response, and the frontal lane, mm -hmm. which is the adult in the room. Mm -hmm. And so you see, why this person's an adult, but why are they acting like a lizard? <laughs> yes. Yes. And so when you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, the decision to count backwards is a moment of taking control. And the counting itself is what activates the prefrontal cortex so that you make the choice to go walk outside so that you then lower your nervous system stress and then you could come back to what you need to do. Hmm. And so it's profoundly effective with addiction, with suicidal ideation, with wow. procrastination, with making more money. Because you're not going to make more money if you're not willing to make the sales calls. You can sit there and think about making them all damn day mm -hmm. long. And so it is... It's changed the lives of millions of people. It's it's just, and I love it because it's free. 
Anybody at any age can use it. Anybody in any language. Just don't count up. One, two, three, four, five. It doesn't work. You have to count it down. You have to because we have been taught to count up since we were little. So ca- the act of counting up already yeah. happens in your subconscious. Yeah. Counting backwards in the beginning, five, four, three, two, one. You have to think about it. Correct. Yeah. The more you use it, you are encoding a habit of taking action, a habit of courage, a habit of confidence, a habit of betting on yourself. And so Mm. it becomes innate. So the five second rule. Wait, first off, when did you discover the five second rule? Okay, so 2009. This is when you first tried it or discovered it or? Oh, it's a total horror show mistake. Okay. Yes. (laughs) Okay. So 2009, um, I was unemployed and feeling like- You unemployed? How? Well, okay. You have too much charisma, too much passion. Uh, yeah, because everything's working right now. That's why. <laughs> I'm not like this when things are not working. Sure, Ask sure. my husband of 22 years. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, what had happened is um, I, I had had all these career changes and I got into the media business, again, by mistake. I had a coaching mm-hmm. business and um, Inc. Magazine was writing an article about coaches and they featured me in it and CNBC called. Got it. And that led to me doing some stuff with CNBC and um, I spent a year still coaching people and then doing some stuff for CNBC and then Fox called and they were interested in having me host a television show. Now, you got to understand, I'm from North Muskegon, Michigan. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, the media business, Fox, <laughs> L.A., yeah. the closest thing I had ever seen to a celebrity, Lewis, was the Muskegon Lumberjacks, the farm <laughs> team, right? Right. From our, for, for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, the, my the dad, double A team or whatever. Yeah, my dad was the hometown doc for the hockey team there. <laughs> right, right, right. So I thought, the mayor was a celebrity. wow, <laughs> my life's about to change. I'm about to be a celebrity. Wow, we're going to solve all, this is amazing, you know? So um, I was originally going to be hosting a, a show for Fox where we were making over small businesses. <clears throat> nice. Yeah, pretty cool, right? We show up, we like do extreme home makeover mm. for the office. Everybody's happy. We all know that doesn't solve business problems, <laughs> but it makes for a nice television show. By the time I get to LA, um, they've changed the format. It's now called Someone's Gotta Go, and I'm going to be firing people on national television from real jobs. Wow. Uh-huh. That sounds fun. Horrible. <sighs> Yeah. Plus, we haven't told the offices that this is what we're doing. Oh, my gosh. So you show up in Act 1, and you've got everybody all like this because they think they're going to get new IKEA furniture and a paint job, and this is going to be the best thing in the world for their small business. Now, meanwhile, I'm a fourth-generation small business owner, so right. that's like my people. Grew up at a kitchen table with farmers, and you know, mm-hmm. my mom had a retail store, and my other grandparents were bakers. And so when it comes to like the heart and soul and what's so important when you launch your own business and how personal it is. I mean, this was like gut-wrenching. So I show up, the first act, you kick out the the owner of the company who then freaks out, then all the employees freak out. Act number two, we announce that somebody's getting fired. And then wow. that's that's the, the bad news. The good news is that I'm not picking. We're going to have you vote somebody out. So oh it's Survivor in an office place. Oh my goodness. So that sucks. When, when I learn all this, I, I have a panic attack, even though I'm on Zoloft. And I call the guy that got me the gig and say, you got to get me out of this. Like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to mm-hmm. me. And he said, um, well, I'm sorry, but they've already cast the entire show and you're out there for five weeks and you don't have a choice. Or they're going to sue you. And oh I said, gosh. then fine, get me some Xanax because I don't think I can get through this thing. Like, this is awful. <laughs> Luckily, um, we taped two episodes and um, legal tabled it. Mm. But here was the problem. I was attached to the show. And I only got paid if the show was shooting. Mm-hmm. So and being an entrepreneur, <laughs> I also kind of put, yes, yeah. put all my energy into this, <clears throat> shut down the coaching thing, um, yeah. uh, really thought that the, it also kind of negotiated a deal that was a sort of a back end deal thinking I'm a, fa- you know, entrepreneur, always sure, thinking sure. about got to have Take a piece a of the action. Yes. More, yeah, of course. What a, yeah, that was a dumb move. <laughs> um, and I was in a contract for a year while they figured out what to do. Mm, so you couldn't do another show. Yeah. So. You know, I just felt like I had made a a huge mistake and I felt really embarrassed. And I didn't know at the age of 41 what I should be doing with my life. And while it's neat that I had jumped careers so many times, I started to feel like somebody that actually wasn't successful at all because I didn't have a career track. I had a bunch of jumps from one thing to another. Now, looking back, it makes perfect sense. But standing in the middle of the mess, 
it just felt like everything was caving in. Probably mm-hmm. just like when you were sleeping on your couch, feeling Absolutely. injured and like everything I thought that was about to happen isn't happening now. Meanwhile, my husband had opened up a restaurant business. It had been his dream. He worked in high tech and came home one day after getting laid off and said, I, I'm i never going to get on a plane and do a PowerPoint presentation for a company. I don't care about her own. And I said, great, what's your plan? And he said, I'm going to open a pizza restaurant. And I looked mm. at him and I said, was there a trust fund that was part of this marriage that I was unaware of? Because I'm not quite sure how we're going to get pre- the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did someone die? You got an insurance policy? Check. Yes. And he said no. And um, uh, I then said the most famous lines of our 22 mar- 22 year marriage, Lewis. I looked at him and I said, listen, buddy, inspiration is for strangers. You get your ass back to that job and you pay the mortgage and you forget the stream. You're not going to this. Wow. So we, well, because change is scary yeah so we fought and he won and the first one was a real home run and he opened a pizza store oh he did yeah 40 40 seats right outside of boston massachusetts he and his best friend and they won best of boston it was incredible what do you do when everything money though they did on the first one (laughs) so what do you do when when everything's working Woo! let's go all chips in let's put in the home equity line let's put in the the kids college savings let's get friends and family and because you're so excited you you think it's going to work so you go big 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 well, the second one did not work at all, and it did not work at all so badly mm. that when it was finally closed, it was close to an $800,000 loss, and mm. it meant our entire home equity line, kids' college savings, everything went right down with it. Mm. That was right when I lost the Fox show. So I'm unemployed. The liens start hitting the house. Um, the phone starts ringing all the time, and it's collections calls. Mm. So you unplug that the phone. That would stress me out. Well, you just unplug the phone. Oh my gosh! I mean, that's gosh. how you deal with that. But I, 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 I remember like, there were. I remember two things from that period of my life that were really painful, and one was having to call the town and tell them that we could not afford the hundred and seventy-five bucks for our sixth grader to play soccer, so we needed to pull her out. And wow. I remember there being times because I was so afraid to look at the checking account that I would stand at the grocery store. And items would scan and I could just feel that wave of anxiety rising, thinking, I don't, I don't think the check card's going to go through. And so I would stand there. I always had an excuse and it was to look at the person and go, oh, that's strange. It just worked at the gas station. Oh my gosh. Because I, what would have been more empowering is to probably say, oh, well, I guess I don't have the money for this. Let's take this, this, and this, and just kind of like the easiest thing to do is to tell the truth. But I was so filled with shame. Yeah. So I started to develop this habit of hitting the snooze button because what would happen is the alarm would go off in the morning and the first thing I would think about is all the problems that we had and how awfully things had gone off the tracks. And you didn't want to deal with them. No. And I, and I also didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't think I could. And this goes back to the feelings. Like you, you think that you need to feel confident or courageous in order to get started. You don't. You actually just have to start. And that's the riddle of life. That lying in bed, hoping that you wake up some morning motivated to change, that's not the answer. You actually have to learn how to push yourself. You have to learn how to, how to leverage the power of your decisions. And you've got to learn how to take action when you don't f- feel like it. Because every morning when I woke up, I did not feel confident. I felt like a loser. I felt like the world's worst parent. I felt like I had failed at every single turn. I did not know if Chris and I could pull out of the spiral. I did not know if we were going to go bankrupt and lose the house and move from our community. I did not know if our marriage would survive. I knew I wanted it to. And see, this is the knowledge action gap. You can know what you want. You can know what you should be doing. But how do you make yourself do it when the feelings and the motivation isn't there, when all you got is fear? And so every night I would I would lie in bed and I would say to myself, all right, that's it, Mel. Tomorrow, it's the new you. Tomorrow, you're going to wake up and be motivated. You're going to you're going to get up. You're going to exercise like everybody says you should. You're going to meditate. You're going to get those kids on the bus. You're going to screw Fox. You're going to look for a job. You're going to cold call Cox Media and you're going to you're going to do auditions. Come on, girl. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You're going to take a cold shower. Woo! You know, here we go. (laughs) And I meant it when I was saying it. Maybe it was the alcohol that was talking. But (laughs) but then I would wake up and I didn't feel any of those things. Mm -hmm. So I would hit the snooze. 
and I would hit the snooze. Now, why was I hitting the snooze when I knew it wasn't the right decision? I'm going to tell you why. And this is something that I was blown away by when I discovered it. You don't make decisions with your goals. You don't make decisions with your prefrontal cortex. You don't make decisions with logic. Do you know how we make decisions? I didn't invent this. A neuroscientist by the name of Damasio, who does his research in Brazil, who gave an incredible TED talk and wrote about this forever and ever and ever. We make decisions with feelings. 95% of our decisions are made by how you feel in the moment. And that is the problem. You need to take control of the moment and leverage the power of your decisions and make them up here. Because when I was lying in bed, I wasn't saying to myself, I should get up because that's going to help me start my day right. I was saying, do I feel like getting up? No, you don't. No. Do you feel like making that cold call? No, you don't. Do you feel like doing that third set of reps? No, you don't. Do you feel like having that hard conversation? No, you don't. Do you feel like ending this relationship, whether it's in business or in your life, that is sucking you dry? No, you don't. We make decisions based on our feelings, and that is robbing you of joy and opportunity. And it is blinding you from the fact that all, how you change your life is one five-second decision at a time. One push at a time. And if you, if you accept the fact that you may never feel ready and you may never feel motivated and you may never feel confident, you may never feel courageous, and that's okay, but you can still push yourself forward. What happens over time is as you start mm. to see yourself becoming the person that takes action, that you start to see yourself becoming the kind of person that speaks, even though your voice is shaking, you're the kind of person that, that, that has a bias toward moving instead of a bias toward thinking, guess what happens? You build the skill of confidence and courage. And so what happened for me is I was stuck, Lewis. I mean, I was so stuck. I was on, I mean, we were heading straight for divorce. We were heading for bankruptcy. I knew I wanted to change things. Mm. And so one night I see this commercial. This is the stupidest story on the planet, but this is what happened. <laughs> I see this commercial. <laughs> and, you know, again, I, I also was drinking too much. I mean, I probably had a couple Manhattans <clears throat> in me. Sure. That's my drink. I'm from the Midwest, All just right. like you. Yeah. All right. A little Manhattan there, <laughs> a little bourbon. Um, and uh, there was a rocket ship launching. On a commercial. Yeah. yeah. And I had this instinct, this innovation, this disruptive idea, right? Oh, my God, Mel. That's the answer. Tomorrow morning, you're going to launch your ass out of bed like a rocket ship. You're going to move so fast, you can't even think about your problems. Dumb, right? Mm -hmm. Totally dumb. See, it's like this is the dumbest <laughs> idea I've ever but, heard. I cannot believe I have this chick on my podcast. No, I, understand. I understand it. you got to get moving first. Yes. That's the thing. you just got to wake up at 6 a.m. or whenever it is and go into the gym. And when you're in the gym, you're going to start moving the first weight. Yes. And then you'll start yes. moving the second Actually, weight. Actually, people, people <clears throat> use the five-second rule at the gym because you sure. know how much time people waste at the gym standing around thinking about the next thing? Probably 70% of the time. Five, right? four, three, two, one. So, yeah. so the next morning, the alarm goes off, and nothing had changed in my life. I woke up. To the lean on the house, the fighting with Chris, the mm -hmm. unemployment, the lack of confidence, the lack of courage, the, like the whole thing. But I did something I had never done before. I went five, four, three, two, one. Just like NASA. I actually counted. And then I stood up and I was like, <laughs> what the hell just happened? Uh-huh. What, what? What? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> the next morning I used it again, it worked. The next morning I used it again, it worked. And then I started to notice something. And this is, this is one of those things. So we have, a, we have an 11-year-old son who has dyslexia. Mm. And when they finally diagnosed him, it was as if, of course. It was as if, like, how could we have possibly missed this? Are we the worst parents in the world? Mm. I mean, the kid can barely write. He can't cut his food. He doesn't read. Like, no wonder he doesn't do team sports. Mm. It was right under our nose. And what I'm about to tell you is right under everybody's nose. There's a five-second window between the instincts, the shoulds, the urges, the inner wisdom, the things that can change your life if you listen to it. You've got a five-second window from the moment you feel that instinct to move. And if you don't, your brain is actually designed to kill it. Five seconds is all you have. The second you hesitate it's actually, and you feel yourself hesitating, that is a moment of huge power because what's happened is you've just started to pull back from something that you need to lean into. 
And if you count backwards five, four, three, two, one, and this is the neuroscience behind why this stupid little trick works, counting is, a, is an action. Mm. Counting backwards <clears throat> requires focus. It's also not a habit for you yet. So when you feel yourself hesitate, you're, you're, you're triggering your mind that something's up. Like Lewis didn't hesitate when he pulled on his pants. He didn't hesitate when he's drinking his coffee. He didn't hesitate when he walked out the door to the gym, but now he's hesitating to make that call. Your mind now goes into a cognitive bias called the spotlight effect. It magnifies whatever it was that you hesitated doing. Mm -hmm. The moment. And the yeah. moment. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you're like, hey, I don't feel like it. Like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll do it later. Right. And your mind is doing it because your mind's trying to protect you. Hesitation signals a red flag to your mind that something's up. Just that small hesitation. It's a habit that we all have. Should you hesitate if you're getting a tattoo? Yes. Should you hesitate <laughs> if you're gambling? Yes. Should you hesitate if you are signing a legal document? Yes. You need your prefrontal cortex for those things. You need to interrupt it, make a power, make a decision. Should you hesitate on making a phone call? No. Should you hesitate on speaking up in a meeting? No. Should you hesitate when you feel yourself starting to procrastinate and you know you got work that you should get done? No, you shouldn't hesitate at all. Should you hesitate in saying the thing that you really feel in your heart? No, you shouldn't. Should you hesitate and edit yourself when you're talking? No, you shouldn't. But we've all trained ourselves to. So it's actually this habit of hesitating. You start catching yourself. It's a huge moment of power because you have a decision to make and you got to make it in the next five seconds. Are you going to go on autopilot and get trapped in your mind? Or are you going to five, four, three, two, one and awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward? Mm. So um, I started to use this rule as I noticed that every day, all day long, I had these moments of inner wisdom where I would know that I needed to pick up the phone and stop isolating myself. Mm -hmm. I would know that I needed to call a bunch of media companies and start auditioning for radio show hosting gigs. I knew that I should get on, get out of bed on time. I knew I should stop myself before I snapped at Chris, mm -hmm. right? Self monitor. Yeah. I knew I should not feel, let the frustration be the things that was driving me. And so I started to use the rule all day long. Whenever I felt this, I should do this, five, four, three, two, one, and I would make myself do it. And slowly, five seconds at a time, my entire life start, started to change. And my husband used it in his business, and he and his business partner dove in. They went on to open seven more restaurants. Um, mm -hmm. I went on to launch and sell two businesses wow. and get recruited by CNN and join their team. I had a syndicated radio show that that um, ended up winning the Gracie Award, which is kind of the female media, you know, awards for nice. the number one talk show in the country. Um, and, you know, I never intended to tell anybody about the five second rule. First of all, because it's stupid. Right. I mean, <laughs> come on. Count backwards. That's the dumbest Not thing Not stupid to me, though. Well, Anything that works, works for me. That's true. You know what I mean? I'll take any stupid thing. That's true. <laughs> I, and so, I, but I also was like, how do you start talking about something like that, right? Yeah. So, um, I was asked to give a TED talk like six years ago. And TED six years ago, not the brand that it was today. Yeah. They weren't even putting the talks online yet. Really? Yeah. The TEDx uh, talks were not online yet. And so, that was the first speech I'd ever given in my life. If you want to see what somebody looks like having a panic attack for 21 <laughs> minutes straight, watch that speech. I was backstage and it was like one PhD after another going out there. I'm They're like, what scientists, the hell have I gotten myself into? This yeah. is the dumbest thing. Um, mm. And so at the very end, I wasn't even planning on talking about it. I say, oh, by the way, there's this thing I do. That's it. I don't even explain it. And you know why I didn't explain it, Lewis? I didn't know why it worked. Mm. So you didn't have the science, the research. You're just Zero. Like Zero. And then something crazy happened. They put that talk online a year later and people started to write. We've heard from more than 100,000 people in 90 countries that have written to us that are using the rule in ways big and small to change their lives, to change their marriages, to change their thinking patterns, to grow their businesses. Um, we know of 11 mm. people that have stopped themselves from killing themselves. Wow. Um, in the moment, there's a gentleman that we talk about in the book and you can see his social media posts in London. He was a, he was a veteran and he was suffering po from post-traumatic stress disorder and he boarded a ferry with the intention of jumping overboard. Mm. And he got to the railing and he was standing there and his inner wisdom kicked in. And this is another thing I want everybody watching to understand. I don't care what you're facing or how low you get. Your inner wisdom is always there. It is. And the thing is, is that we often don't listen to it. And so he's standing there intending to kill himself and that inner wisdom kicks in. 
and he remembers the five second rule. And he goes five, four, three, two, one, and he turns and physically moves away from the railing and finds the first person working on the ferry and tells him that he's suicidal. Mm. Saved his life. Wow. He saved his life because he listened to the inner wisdom. And this is the other thing I love about this rule. It's not something to think about. It's a tool to use. So the part of the problem with a lot of the advice that I've found for me personally is that a lot of advice is all about kind of doing mental battle. Mm -hmm. And if I go upstairs, I'm behind enemy lines and I tend to get hijacked. <laughs> right. So I love this tool because 54321 interrupts those patterns it actually prompts the part of the brain that I need in order to change. And it makes changing easier because I've now got my mind working for me instead of against me. And it gets me out of my head. And so um, I'm, I'm super excited to share this rule with people mm. because I now know not only that it's working, just not, not for me, it's working for people around the world. And, you know, in the book, it took me three years to write it. It's all the science behind the rule. Yeah. It's got more than 150 social media posts in it. So you see stories from around the world of people using it to end procrastination, to build confidence, to deepen their relationships, to launch businesses, to explode the sales. Why does it help with sales? I'll tell you why. Because you can't sell by thinking. Okay. Selling is about action. We have, we have um, um, <coughs> groups from companies around the world, sales teams, that put 54321 up on the wall. Really? I'm sure they hate me. That's cool. Yes, because what cold calling, it's a momentum thing. It if you is. stop and think, the phone is not getting, the dialing is not happening when you're thinking. Yeah. If you're thinking about all those no's you've been getting, yes. you're not going to want to do it again because yes. it doesn't feel good. Yes. And if you're in the middle of a negotiation or you're in the middle of a really difficult conversation, and again, remember what we said earlier? You cannot control your feelings that rise up but you can always control how you think and what you do. So if you're in the middle of a difficult conversation and you feel those feelings come up that normally trigger you to start editing yourself or to censor yourself or to silence yourself or to think sabotaging thoughts in like a business negotiation, five, four, three, two, one, awaken the prefrontal cortex, mm. get back in the game. I want to talk to you about my favorite phrase when it comes to motivating yourself. And I know if you've followed me for a while, you have heard me say this phrase before, but this is so accurate. It's so motivating. Uh, before I tell you what this phrase is, let me ask you, have you ever had an experience where you were so frustrated with yourself because you knew that there were things that you wanted to start doing or there were changes that you wanted to make or things that you wish you could prioritize and you just couldn't seem to pull yourself out of the day-to-day -day grind. That no matter how much you thought about it or contemplated it or just wanted things to change, that whether it was self-doubt or fear or the demands of your day-to-day -day life, you just couldn't seem to make traction on changing. Yeah, I see some of you going, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm trying constantly and nothing's gaining traction. I feel frustrated all the time because as much as I think about the things that I really want to be doing, I don't see myself making forward progress, right? It's almost like when I was in college, or no, high school, when I was in high school, I had a gerbil named Ralph. And let me tell you about this gerbil, okay? <laughs> this gerbil made me kind of angry, honestly. And the reason why this gerbil made me kind of angry is because he was really, really quiet during the day. Like he would nestle into his like, you know, little shredded thing in the corner. And he never was that social or interested when I was um, walking into the room. And I'll tell you what, the second, the second that I would turn off the lights in my bedroom to go to sleep, that freaking gerbil would get on that wheel and just and 
Do you ever have a pet like that? Very nocturnal. We currently have a cat, Mr. Noodle. I see somebody going, until midnight, oh my gosh. Um, and when I get into those modes where there's something that I really want to do, like I feel this kind of friction and this frustration with myself because I know that I'm not as happy as I could be. I know that there's a change I need to make. I know that I'm focused on the wrong stuff. I know that my emotions are getting the best of me. I often feel like my mind is my gerbil Ralph on the hamster wheel, just spinning, 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 spinning. So can you relate to that? Can you relate to that? Yeah, of course you can, because that is like such a common experience of sort of knowing this thing that you want and you can just all oh, reach it, but you, you don't have that sensation that you're actually grabbing it. Um, I'm so glad that so many of you relate to this because I've been thinking about this a lot. And now I am, of course, overheating, so I'm going to take off my sweater. That's what happens when you're 53. Um, and I think about this a lot because, you know, I see even people that I love struggling with this. We have a daughter who uh, is a singer songwriter studying pop music out at USC. She's got all the talent, all the resources, all the skills, and there's always something that is stopping her from just starting to put music out, right? Or maybe you can relate to that in health you really are like, this is the year, this is the year. Like for me, I keep thinking, I gotta like take some time to get the hormone thing. Uh, like just understand it. Like what food should I even be eating? And I think about it like that hamster on the wheel, but I can't seem to make myself launch forward. Uh, another example I can give you is for years, everybody, I dreamt of launching a podcast. And I would watch all these people that I admire out in the world launching a podcast. And I would just spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. And so I'm so glad that you can relate to this. So tell me, is there some project or some area of your life or a business or a goal or some change that you want to make that you feel like you think about all the time, but you just can't seem to push through all of that thinking or push through the, 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 the fatigue or the overwhelm or how do I get started, right? You can't seem to just push through. Is there some area of your life where you feel that way? If so, I want you to write it in the comments, okay? I see I want to work with animals. I see somebody going, oh my gosh, I keep thinking about doing a TikTok account. Oh, I want to get control of my addiction. Oh, I want to launch a business. Oh, I, I really want to get a degree, but I feel like it's too late. Um, and you may be telling yourself uh, that uh, it, things just feel like it's too late, Mel. Like I, I got a divorce and now it feels like my life is frozen. I see some of you saying. I feel like Ever since I got the divorce or the pandemic hit or I lost the job or I took the wrong job or I moved to the wrong place or I realized that I wanted to start this thing and I started it, but now it's stalled out and I'm embarrassed to keep starting. I want to finish my PhD. I want to be persistent with the gym. I want to get back to creating art. I see all this stuff that y'all are writing down. It's beautiful. I see so many of you saying that you have a little side hustle and you know that you want to turn your attention towards it, but you just can't seem to literally push through whatever it is, the fear, the overwhelm, the busyness of your life to laser focus on what really matters to you. And I think that's why it's so painful because you're not going to stop really wanting and longing for those things that you keep thinking about everybody. They're going to linger for the rest of your life. You're going to have to, at some point, make a decision that it is important enough to you to make changes so that the thing that you want to see happen or the life that you don't want to miss out on or the degree that you always longed to get 
or the way that you want to feel in your body or the energy. For me, a big theme uh, recently has been about loneliness. I am so lonely in my personal life because of the pandemic, because our kids have launched, because we're moving to Vermont, because I'm always working. Like I can see very clearly that I have tried to solve loneliness in my personal life by working all the time. And that's not the right solution for loneliness. And so I even see all this. And so I'm glad that you can see an area of your life where you feel this friction and tension because you know that you want to focus more time and energy there, but there's so much resistance and there's so much friction and there's so much else going on that it is robbing you of the ability to push forward toward the life that you really want to be living. And look, it's not going to happen overnight, but so let me tell you, let me tell you, this sentence, this truth about life that I truly love, that, that always kicks me in the rear end, honestly. And here it is. No one is coming. That's it. No one's coming. No one is going to come into your life and do the work for you. No one is going to come into your life and uh, just remove your problems. No one is going to come into your life and uh, make your dreams come true. When it comes to the changes that you want to make, when it comes to the things that you long for in your heart, when it comes to the music that you want to put out into the world or the TikTok account that you want to create or the degree that you want to get or the life you want to build after divorce or after your partner dies or after, you know, you change jobs or after the kids launch, when it comes to those things that you deeply long for, deserve and desire, no one's coming. You are not too late. If you're breathing, you're watching this video, you have plenty of time to create a life that makes you happy, to create a life that is full of meaning for you, whatever that means. You have plenty of time to take control, to heal. It is so important for you to hear that, that you have plenty of time, but no one's coming. At some point, you have to make a decision and you'll often hear me say you're one decision away from a different life, a better life. But you have to make the decision. No one's coming to make the decision for you. You have to decide that you are done feeling beaten up. You're done feeling lost. You're done feeling stuck. You're done feeling isolated. That all that crap that you've been enduring, you're freaking done. You have to decide that. And what's interesting is that once you decide, you realize no one's coming. Like I often joke that, you know, I'm not the kind of expert that really learns this stuff by reading it in a book. Unfortunately, I'm kind of a stubborn learner. So my life has required me to either fall into a hole or dig one for myself. And then I wallow at the bottom of the hole, feeling sorry for myself and stuck and frustrated and angry. And then I realize, oh my God, nobody's coming. Like if I want to get out of this hole that I'm in emotionally, financially, health wise, in my career, in my, whatever the hole may be, I got to build the ladder. And it's that decision. I'm not staying here. I don't know where I'm going, but it's not here. It's that decision, the decision that no one's coming to do this for me. I'm deciding that I want more. I'm deciding that these last two years where I felt like I got thrown into a dryer and life just tumbled me around and all of a sudden the dryer stopped and I'm like in there covered in lint and beaten up and staticky. We got to kick the door open people. We got to make a decision that all that crap that you just struggled through and that you learned through that it happened so that you could wake up and you could literally make a decision that the next freaking chapter of your life, you're not going to be unhappy. You're not going to just get by. You are going to make a decision that you are going to do the work to change. And here's what's fascinating. Once you decide, that's it. That's it. I'm changing. That's it. I'm going to do the work, whatever it takes. I made a decision 
that our kids have left this house that we've raised them in. I'm here alone all the time working. I'm like, I'm sad. I'm miserable. I, like, I got to change. I can't just hold on and grip to what I know, especially if it's making me unhappy. And here's the thing, letting go, deciding that it's time for a change, that's a lot easier than gripping onto stuff that's no longer meant to you. And so when you make a decision, and I see so many of you going, my life fell apart after divorce. My life, uh, you know, blows because of my job. My life has been in stuck mode ever since this person I love died, or my life is just kind of boring and I miss having fun, okay? Like when you kind of have that wake up moment and you're like, oh my God, nobody's gonna come and do this for me. No friends are showing up to bring the, the party bus. If I wanna have my life feel like a party bus, I gotta be the one that actually is driving it. You know what I'm saying? So um, here's the cool thing, no one's coming. Once you make that decision, here's the cool thing. Everybody shows up when you ask for help. Everybody shows up when you ask for help. Do not try to change on your own. I tried that for so long. Yes, it's your responsibility. Yes, you need to the, do the work, but don't do it on your own. Do not do that. You know, I just got a text about 11 minutes ago from a really good friend of mine. I'm not gonna say who my friend is, because many of you probably know who this person is because she has a large uh, social media following and uh, she's absolutely amazing. And she reached out to me kind of sheepishly and she said, a um, couple people have been asking me if I would speak at a big event. I know nothing about this. I'm scared to do it, but I've decided that this is something I wanna try. Now, she made a decision that this is something she wants to walk toward, even though she's scared. And did you notice what she did? She didn't try to figure it out on her own. She reached out to me to ask for help. Now, I'm gonna coach her. I'm gonna tell her everything I know. I have been the most booked female speaker in the world for years. I am one of the most successful motivational speakers on the corporate circuit ever on the planet, male or female. And so, there are so many mistakes I made trying to do it on my own. When I think about how much I have learned about things like speaking or podcasting or even my marriage or raising kids, the mistake that I make when I try to do it on my own, holy cow, talk about headache and heartache. She's so smart. She made a decision to walk towards something she wants but that she's afraid of. And then she asked for help. Because the secret is once you know that you don't want to be where you are, that's all you need to know in order to change your life. I don't know where I'm going. I just don't know what, I, I don't want to stay here. That's a starting spot. That's perfect. That means you started. That's the first rung of the ladder. I'm not staying where I am. The next one is literally figure out what people who have what you want, whether it's just, just people who are happy or what are they doing that you're not doing? There's a little bit of the map. And then you gotta ask for help. And so I can think of times in my life where I have been trying to do something new, whether it's fix an issue in my marriage. I don't do that on my own. Are you kidding me? My husband and I, we go to a marriage therapist and ask for help. We talk to very close friends of ours about what's going on and ask for help. Um, when I get serious about wanting to make a change, uh, it's the new Mel Robbins. Mel Robbins, for the first 45 years, I would try to do it in secret. I would try to figure it out on my own. I was embarrassed to tell people that I needed structure and accountability and I needed to be told what to do and I needed somebody to bring some energy. And so I don't do that anymore. That's one of the reasons why my success has skyrocketed. And it's what I'm also doing with now the other areas of my life, happiness, balance, ease, a better business model. I'm freaking asking for help. I'm surrounding myself with people that bring the energy and bring the accountability and bring the structure. And that's exactly what my friend did by texting me. Hey, I know this person that's ahead on the path. 
I'm going to like, now that I know, and I've taken the steps and I've got, I'm, I'm asking her to give me advice, to tell me what to do. And so while no one's coming, which I hope is a freaking wake up call for you. I hope that's exactly what you needed to hear right now. In fact, tell me in the comments, what does no one's coming mean to you? And don't be snarky, you know, and sexual about it. I know I went viral on TikTok because some kids made fun of me for saying that. But seriously, what does that mean when you think about your dreams or you think about your life or you think about what you want, that no one is going to come in here and do this work for you? that no one is going to heal you. No one is going to do what you need to do to have the breakthrough that you need in order to create the life that I do not want you to miss out on, okay? So once you make that decision that you are literally done with where you are, that you are going to do the work, well, now I'm here. So. I have to tell you, I want to help you. I want to be your coach. I'm just going to ask. I want to be your coach. If you have ever thought, wow, how cool would it be to have Mel Robbins as my coach? This is actually the only opportunity you're going to get in 2022. I have decided after reading your DMs and after reading your emails and after seeing what you have gone through, through this pandemic, I'm so proud of you. And guess what? It's time to frickin' launch. It's time to launch forward. It's time to shake off the negativity, the sadness, the stuckness, the isolation, and it's time to take control of your life. And that's why I want to be your coach. Seriously. I'm Elena. I'm 33 and I'm an illustration artist and a little bit of a backstory. So um, starting with the sad stuff first so my my parents <laughs> sorry my parents passed away um my dad in 2018 and my mother in 2019 two traumas for me um but uh, therapy is going really really well so i'm i'm good um i left my work field um i have a bachelor in educational science uh, so in german it's pedagogic pedagogy in english i don't know yeah. um, and i opened my own online shop uh, in january 2021 um, where i sell my illustrations and stuff and um, i now have <laughs> an exhausting uh, part-time job uh, a cleaning part-time job because I have to pay my bills I have yeah. I have to live yeah, and um, 12 hours a week um, like I said really exhausting but it's fine it yeah that's well you up. also said though that you literally have no debt and you have savings right yeah exactly um, well that's pretty damn good yeah <laughs> Um, I mean, gonna... like, so one thing I want to, I want to point out to everybody, yeah. I have a terrible habit of focusing on what's going wrong. You're not giving yourself enough credit. Me? Let me tell it. Let, let me, let me tell you, Elena, yeah. a different way to tell that story. I lost my mom and dad. Devastating. And uh, I'm really proud of myself, which you did say because I've done a tremendous amount of work and I've pulled myself up by my mood straps and I sell my illustrations online. And you know what? Even though it's a lot of work, 12 hours a week, I work this job cleaning. It's enough to pay my bills. It gives me time to do other things. I have no debt. I have savings. And this girl has some big dreams. And that's why I signed up for B-School. Exactly. And when I read your thing, you want to be a travel blogger, it sounds like. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. <laughs> Does that scare you? Uh, not at all. Um, I'm pushing myself quite a lot. Um, even before my parents passed, uh, I was, uh, I was, I, I had the goal, okay, I want to make my illustration job and so on. Um, but here's the thing. Um, Tell me the thing. 
<laughs> I'm doing this uh, since, like I said, I mean, I, I draw for more years now, but um, I started the the online business 2021. Uh, so yeah, um, and I'm not making that much income. Sometimes there are months where I'm making nothing, and okay. that's totally fine because I'm at the beginning. Um, I also have. Um, that's also good to know. I um, I have an Instagram. I have a YouTube channel. I love okay. making videos. I, I'm learning so much. Um, I started TikTok. Um, I I have my homepage. I'm writing blog posts. Mel, I also wrote a blog post about you. <laughs> oh. Um, I'll have to read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let me ask you a question because there's a huge theme here. You guys noticing the theme with everybody? You guys all have lots of stuff going on. And that's an important thing if you need to have a lot of stuff going on to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And I love that you're saying that your illustrations and that store is at the very beginning of the process and that that's gonna take time. That's true. But here's what I don't hear. What do you want? your life to look like? I want this to go pretty well. Um, I want to be able, um, like I wrote, um, I want to be able to travel. And my goal is um, to make this happen next year. And okay. I, yeah. And so I've, what do you mean by travel? See, the other thing mm -hmm. I'm going to keep pointing out to everybody is that Before you can figure out the plan or the map to get where you want to go, you got to pick your head up and point at what you want. And the more specific the destination, the better. It is impossible to give you great guidance and coaching if I don't know exactly what you want, because here's the thing. If you really wanted life where you travel, I can tell you 10 travel bloggers that you should follow. You can stalk their stories. And with your skills, you could probably be making money and doing that full time in a matter of three to six months. Because there are magazines that are looking for freelancers to do that. Once you get with one hotel, they connect you with another hotel. Once you start tagging people, cafes, it, it is one of those things that builds. You've told me you have no debt, that you have savings, that you have a job that is 12 hours a week that is not keeping you somewhere. So what do you actually want? I know when I want to, when I do this next year. So my, my first goal is to go to Japan again for three months. Okay. And I know that um, at my part-time job, they won't let me go and uh, say, okay, it's unpaid vacation. And when you come back here, yeah, you can start again. So I know, okay, I have, it's kind of. So, so um, here's, here's what's interesting. You ready? Yeah. I'm going to push you a little bit. Yeah, please. <laughs> Do you have, a, is that house that you're sitting in a place that you own that you have to pay for? Nope, it's a flat. And it's, uh, it's the flat of my best friend. Um, and I have to pay such less money. Let me, um, let me tell you something. Yeah. Your whole life is organized around what's happening at this 12 hour week job. Yes, Exactly. Do you know why I'm pointing that out? Um, I'm no. <laughs> we are in the single best job market in 40 years. Uh, what, what was my best uh, job? No, no, no. This is the best job market in 40 years. People cannot find people to work. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to tell you is that you're organizing your entire life around a part-time job. I know where you're going. <laughs> where am yeah. I going? 
Yeah, I had I have the exact same thought. Um, they are. No, but where jobs. am I going? Where am there I going? Should... I'm going to push you. There are shitty jobs out there everywhere. I can, I can. There's a shitty job in Japan waiting. for Yeah, everywhere. I know. Yeah. Your issue is courage. Yeah. That's fun because courage is one of my things that I'm keeping pushing myself. Okay. Yeah. Prove it. Yeah. That's right. You're, and I'm, and, and I, and I have a feeling that you holding on to where you are has to do with grieving. Grieving and maybe okay, my my because I have a partner and he also lives here. But I think we can maybe hopefully figure something out. Elena. Yeah. Hope is for children on Christmas morning who hope no that they're yeah. gonna get a certain present. You are a 33-year-old brilliant woman who has taken control of her healing, who has figured out how to set up an entire business around your illustrations. You have paid off your debt. You have savings. We are no longer in a game of hope. We are in the business of creating a life yeah. that's amazing. And that begins the moment you wake up and go, what the fuck am I doing? I'm worried about this job. I am going to call a meeting tonight with my partner and I'm going to say, here's what we're doing. Yeah. We are going to reinvent our lives. Fuck it. Let's figure out how to go to Japan for three months. Because mm -hmm. this shitty job is going to be here. And so is this flat when we decide we don't like it. And if I burn through my savings trying to figure something out because I can't figure out how to make that work then I'll just save more money. Yeah. You have nothing to lose. I'm writing courage big on courage. <laughs> and yeah. courage means action. Yeah. You're that's going nice. to feel afraid, but this is the day. No, that's, that's normal growth. You're not going to grow in that flat. And you're yeah. not going to grow next year. And I'm not going to allow you to wait another year. Yeah. And this is exactly what I'm feeling. I'm so, every time I wake up, I'm doing my stuff and I'm doing quite a lot of stuff. And I wrote it also to you. Wait, let me point this yeah, out. I saw this. it. I don't need this. You don't need that. I don't need yeah. this story. I don't care how much you're doing. You're doing the wrong stuff. Yeah. I'm fucking busy too. And for a long time, it was the wrong stuff, which is why yeah. I was miserable. The only thing I, I felt why I feel so um, why I ask you if it's a naive or so, because I'm not making that much income or not at all income now. This is Who cares? Been, yeah. Who cares? So you're not making a lot of income, which only means if you stay in the place that you're in, you're going to stay trapped because you don't have enough income. You're not going to have enough income next year either. Yeah. Take a risk. Live mm -hmm. a little. You can come back to this. Yeah. This was exactly what I was feeling the whole time. When I Well, I hope this is exactly what you do. Yeah. Because feeling it, unless it activates action. Yeah. You might as well just like, you know, fart because it doesn't do anything. Like it just is like you need to, to get frustrated and yeah. say, I'm done with this. <laughs> I am sick of myself. In fact, let's pick a date right now. What day are you going to Japan or going to another country or quitting this job? Give me the day. Let's let's commit publicly right now. It's March 22nd. March or April. Um, Give me a date. Let's uh, pull the calendar. Okay, let's say uh, April the 1st. April 1st? Hell yes. <laughs> All right, great. You're going to keep okay. us posted on where you're doing and what your plan is. Um, I will. Lalo, will you put Glow Autonomo, her account in the um, in Instagram? Thank you. She started travel blogging, I think, seven years ago. And uh, a really amazing woman, really good friend of mine, super inspiring. Okay. Lalo. 
She'll give okay. you tips. And I think on her YouTube channel, she's got all kinds of stuff about how to get started. She's killer. I also haven't found an illustrator who does this because I would love to Great. So, incorporate see, Listen, do, I think your ideas are incredible. Go do them. Okay. <laughs> Here's an illustration. You ready? Yeah. Give us an illustration of the moment that you got off your ass and quit that job. <laughs> okay. And then give us an illustration of you uh, like buying the plane ticket. And then give us an illustration of how scared you are as you see the savings go down a little. And then yeah. give us an illustration of what your partner looks like when he's like, wait, what? We're going where? <laughs> and then give us an illustration of your first day in Japan. Yeah. And then give us a let, take us on the journey with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Awesome. You're awesome. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.